Daniel Chani, great director of, uh, from Mellon, which is a creative cultural consultancy. And we uh, research um, areas that have to do with the role of making in our future lives. In relation to maker spaces, governance is shifting and um, in terms of maker movement I kind of question that the, the name is very useful for anyone who wants to talk about it but actually it's not a movement in the sense of a shared goal and there's no central organizing group. So um, in terms of central governance there is none. There's a lot of different people with different motives. What we all share is a process rather than making. Um, and there are different communities. And within these communities, some of them are more professional and you can call them communities of practice. And some are uh, social and they are, uh, the governance is more of the organizations that get them together. So this is really interesting now because uh, there's been a lot of hype around the maker movement. And so the question is, what is beyond the hype, really? And is it affecting policies? Are we seeing things like, can we make a connection with the recent uh, Swedish uh, um, direction to uh, fund re repair through tax? Is that connected to sharing economy? Is sharing economy connected to maker culture? Um, are we seeing um, bigger companies changing the way that they uh, distribute because of makers. Uh, there are things that we can say about education, that we're, we have examples in education that are being uh, maybe challenged or um, um, the programs that supplement mainstream education. Uh, I think the impact is beginning to be in all kinds of areas, but uh, social impact of the maker culture, um, I think, will be evident when bigger shifts happen. Uh, I think when you when you ask is there impact, we also have to consider if it's impact that is recognized as making, or is it impacting on things which you can't call making, but that the maker movement or the maker values or the maker behavior has changed it. So is it really, imp I can't say it's really impacting on uh, consumerism. It might have even fueled it. So um, if we're looking at um, how people respond socially to need, to care, to humanitarian causes, we're seeing amazing projects that are getting more attention. Uh, and we're seeing uh, also people uh, relating to making as a, something they're interested in, in high streets, in fashion. And, uh, so we can see impact, but which one of these are um, temporary and surface and which are deeper? It's a great opportunity to understand where people talk and share which platforms they do it on and find ways of connecting between platforms people are actually using. I think it could be a very influential to um, identify the, the tools, the specifically IT tools that different communities share outside the maker culture. So I use these joint um, platforms to, for instance, promote uh, collaborative innovation, open design, uh, open innovation, um, and I think CAPS can also uh, enable people to uh, learn uh, why uh, make. So, and I would say that for two two different uses that CAPS could, uh, that the make it project could influence and contribute is one is to help people understand why making is important to the future of our lives. So for people who are not makers to become interested, appreciate and understand. And that means that connecting the caps to other networks that 
second group is very much about um, people who are making to be able to uh, connect their making to a purpose. So find joint purpose and, and uh, all these pockets work together for bigger ideas.